everyone. Welcome to Study with Steph episode two. Today we're going to be talking about the CTS exam from a technical perspective, a little bit about how you can prepare for the day of, um, how to test in person, as particularly during these times, um, the things you're allowed to bring with you, the things you're not allowed to bring with you, how many test questions there are and all of that. But before we cover that, I did really quickly want to have a corrections corner. Uh, in the first episode where Gary and I were talking a little bit about the history of the CTS and first about how to apply to take the test, we talked about how you have to pay for it. So we were wondering if you only had to pay if you pass, but that is not true. So the actual rule is you pay a full fee the first time when you schedule your test, I believe. If you fail the first time, you are allowed up to two retests and you do have to pay a retesting fee one or like each time you retest, but that retesting fee is not going to be as high as the original testing fee. Um, after two retest attempts, you have 90 days to wait and then you have to completely restart the application process over, repay that original testing fee, et cetera, et cetera. And so it starts again. So. Um, in the initial episode where it lives on the RAVE website, I attach the fee schedule from Avixa so you can double check and see how much you have to pay each time. Um, and I also linked the Avixa CTS candidate handbook where it has all of those rules printed as well in case you wanted to see it from there. Um, so sorry about that the first time Gary and I were wondering about that. So I'm glad I found the answer. Um, Avixa, please don't be mad at me. Sorry. Okay, so here's episode two. <laughs> and we are starting now. Hey, everybody, welcome to the second episode of study with Steph. Um, last episode, I was joined by Gary Kay. And he told me a little bit about the background of the CTS and its history. And we talked about why I would even want to do this. <laughs> and this time I'm talking a little bit about the exam, what's expected of me, and the best test taking strategies there are before I really get into the studying portion. So today I'm joined by Greg Bronson, technical advisor at Avixa, and Justin Watts. He worked on the third edition of the exam guide, which I have right here. You can kind of see. <laughs> so uh, welcome, you guys. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great. So I wanted to get right into it and talk a little bit about like what you even do if you decide, hey, I think that I want to get my CTS. Uh, how do I know if I'm even eligible to take it? So Greg, like what would the next step be? So the um, so what we're going to want to do is make sure I'm sure you can um, insert over the video the link to the certification page for the CTS. Um, and so they're certainly going to want to start there. They're going to want to make sure that they go and they look at the handbook and see what their um, uh, pre-qualifications are going to be. Um, um, and then, you know, detail it out well there. Um, and then the other key thing is, I know we'll talk about this more um, later as well, is that website something they're going to want to keep refreshing so that they get the latest information related to actually test because of COVID. Um, it's certainly a moving window there in terms of the site's availability and registering for the actual test. Gotcha. But pretty much if anyone in our industry wants to take it, they're pretty much going to be eligible to take it. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So moving right into the scope of the exam. So I've gone to evixa.org slash CTS. I've looked it up. I've decided I want to take the test. Um, so looking into the scope. So the last time I saw it updated, it was 47% creating AV solutions, 27% implementing AV solutions, and 26% servicing AV solutions. So how was this decided for how they were going to split that up? So when they actually put together the original uh, 
certification and the encompassing study guides and whatnot around it, they developed <clears throat> essentially a job task analysis. And so some very brainy people who are a lot brainier than I uh, got into a room and decided what specifically we actually do in our jobs. And I know that's a fun thing because I, I can't even tell my mom what I do, trying to encapsulate it as something that she can uh, take to her friends and say, hey, my son does this. Um, it, it's a, it's a very interesting process and it's always evolving too, which is something that I find uh, very cool. So what we see it, again in the third guide is the, the latest revision to that accredited standard reflecting more of what we do in our daily lives. Uh, that's the cool thing about the CTS certification. It really is that, that benchmark that extols the value, so to speak, of what we do and how we do it. So uh, through a, a body of our peers, uh, we broke it down into those component parts, and that became the CTS exam as we know it today. Got you. I mean, that makes sense. I also have trouble telling my family what I do as my job. So I definitely understand you there. Um, so in terms of how the exam has evolved over time, um, the AV technology is obviously something that's forever changing. It changes every few months. So the CTS exam obviously has to change to reflect the industry. So I know that there it gets updated every few years, but how how is it um, how does it how do you make sure it stays current? So there is a component when it comes to the the job task analysis and kind of the the, the encompassing building of the program that is a bit uh, prognostic and a little future casting looking forward. Obviously, we can't hit all the dots. It, it, yeah. our, our industry changes literally every month, as it seems like nowadays. So it is something where we do try to make it as much of a, um, a base level comparison as possible without getting too much into very uh, nitpicky specific technologies and moreover just of the over encapsulating components that comprise our role because the basics really probably aren't going to drastically change as we go along. I mean, we have seen a shift into some more IT centric functions in a lot of areas. Um, we, there has been a, a dial back approach to having to sell a solution so much as is to understanding and partnering with customers and building those relationships. So a lot of the CTS, uh, while we changed certain domain areas, a lot of the conceptual basis is still the same as it was when it first started. The goal is to codify what we do as an industry and to really nail that down and provide that stamp of quality. So once one walks in the door, they see CTS, they know they're getting an expert. So it is definitely something that um, some attention is paid to future proofing, but it, there's not a whole lot you can do in that arena because Again, if we changed it as often as our industry changes, we'd be on, you know, guide number 5,416 at this point in time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so next question, in the before times um, when you would test in person, <laughs> uh, you know, throwback Thursday. <laughs> I love that, the before time. That's, that, that is the best description ever. Thank you so much. <laughs> it sounds really post-apocalyptic, but like, <laughs> I just feel like, it makes sense to use that here. So in, in those times when I would apply to take the test in person, how far out would I, if I know, so now I know that I want to take the test in six months. I know I want to take the test in June. So how far out would you have recommended me apply to take it versus how is that working now during COVID? Oh man, Greg, how? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it doesn't hurt to, and I, I would have to honestly defer to what might be um, in print, so to speak, um, in the study guide and or on the website. But I think it's fair to say it doesn't hurt to, within the time frame you're in, you know, six months, you, you need to kind of parallel process. You need to say, okay, like in your case, right, you've got a specific goal um, of time, not to say a lot of people may have that similar thing. Um, that would be time bound. And then you can say that right up front as you apply. So you're going to be, you're going to be applying at a time when you're still studying and you're going to be saying, Hey, wait a minute, I'm not sure. And then certainly if you get to the point where 
you're not comfortable. I, that's one of the things I would underscore is don't, don't actually schedule until you start to have a predominance of confidence, right? That you're ready to, to sit for the exam. Um, and then only at that point, then schedule it. It becomes an extra certain, uh, certainly it becomes an extra um, huge variable, right? That none of us can predict as to whether the testing centers, right? That you want and need to go to, um, in this case, whether it's at the show or whether it's your regional, right? Testing center is gonna be open um, because of COVID, um, let alone what kind of pent up demand might be for how quick those seats go. Um, so I guess another thing that I would say is it comes to my mind, if I was doing it, I would also then, I'd want to be aware of myself and, and potentially share that um, when you're consulting with the folks to apply for the exam to say, hey, there's a specific thing that is, that is time binding me. You know, I have a work commitment. Um, that I feel I need to accomplish by such such a date. Um, and then that's gonna, I think, help influence of what kind of lead time, you know, you're gonna wanna okay. put into it. But. Um, so before you would take it in person at a Pearson testing center, correct? And those mm -hmm. are all over the country and the world, I'm pretty sure. Um, but now it's Pearson's using an online testing function during COVID, is that correct? Yes, so it depends upon, uh, I've seen it, um, I, I do know it is available, I do mm -hmm. not know the scope of ready availability at this point in time, because uh, at one point in time it was up and I heard that some people couldn't get through it. Um, I would say specifically for us in this, in this endeavor, uh, mm -hmm. treat it just like you would anything else. I mean, treat it just like you would in the, in the in-person examination. Uh, the, the body of knowledge has not changed. Yeah. The the body of preparation should not change either. So, you know, that six month bubble is a fantastic way to look at it, knowing, okay, I'm going to take this in six months. I'm going to go ahead and book my testing time. It gives me a fantastic uh, finish line to yeah. start striving, striving towards. And to be fair, here's a view is an exceptional partner for us in this endeavor. I mean, they've moved probably literal mountains at this point in time to try and keep us moving forward and keeping this going. So the only thing I would say is uh, when it comes to being in person versus being on this new online testing endeavor, uh, it might require a little more self-discipline. So getting into a piercing view testing center, when you go in, it's a very uh, regimented, very austere process. You know, you, you, divest, you, you divest yourself of everything, you know, cell phone, all that fun stuff. Yeah. You walk in, you sit down, you do your brain dump on your, your little cheat sheet for all your uh, AV math formulas and you take the test. Um, one of the things that I found in my new wonderful working from home environment, and there's air quotes around wonderful working from home <laughs> environment, is that uh, me being at home, sometimes I have to step my game up a little bit because I'm kind of comfortable here. So things may have slide a little bit. Um, being able to recognize that and as, as Greg mentioned, to understand the areas that you're still kind of fudgy on, that, that's important. But uh, as far as comparatively between the, the online venue and the in-person venue, your preparation shouldn't change that much. It's still pretty regular. and. Honestly, it might actually be more readily available in the online venue as well. So we're trying to see what the future of that looks like. Got you. And it might be a little different for me as well, because my plans are to take the exam at Infocom 2021. Um, and there are options for that, correct? So like, I, I, I'm, from my understanding, a lot of people take this test at yes. Infocom. Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. Um, so. I used to teach the CTS prep examination at Infocom, the three-day um, and that was probably one of the best parts of my job at Infocom was uh, seeing folks take the test at Infocom and getting at first that immediate feedback that you passed, yeah. but second, getting the immediate feedback from thousands of individuals yeah. who did the exact same thing you just did yeah. and are commis you know, being commensurate with you in your celebration, sharing in that awesomeness. So a lot of folks take it there. It is uh, a fantastic advantage because you get, if you take the CTS prep prior and you go straight from that into the exam, 
the, uh, the, the spaghetti is still fresh in the noodle, so to speak. <laughs> you got a chance to really go through and knock it out. And it's a really cool experience personally. Yeah. yeah. So that is my plan. 2021. I want to be in the trenches with everyone. I want to be able to celebrate if I pass it or commiserate with everyone if I don't pass it the first time. So, cause, so that kind of leads me into my segue here. A lot of people, from my understanding, do not pass the first time. Uh, it depends what you quantify as a lot. I mean, okay. the CTS does have a, a pretty nominal pass fail rate. Uh, it's not like you walk in and just droves of people walk out uh, un- unaccredited at that point in time. Um, I would say that it is not a test we take in lightly in the same thing with the CTSD and the CTSI. Uh, these are ANSI accredited certifications that again are designed to be that qualitative stamp on your body of work as an AV professional and bring that forward. You know, if you're getting serious about the alphabet soup after your name, CTS is a great place to start. So it's not something you should just take lightly. However, it is not a brand new entity to anyone or should be to anyone in our industry. There should be something about the CTS examination, something about what the book encompasses that makes you feel at home. Because again, it is the, the body of work. You know, Our peers got together and said, hey, this is what we're doing. Um, there should be something there that appeals to you in your current job and your delivery. So there should be something you feel comfortable with. And as Greg said, you know, do the study, take the pretests that are available on the CTS website, uh, do the digging, find the areas that you need help with. And, you know, if you need help and you can't figure it out, find someone to help you. There are tons of communities out there on Twitter, on Facebook, that are full of people who have gone this way before and who are willing and able and very, very, very happy to reach out and help you. Yeah. So, you know, take advantage of all of the aspects in your little ecosystem to build your toolbox to really succeed in this test. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's, that's what this podcast is about, right? This is me keeping myself accountable and me having a different background and experience than a lot of AV professionals. Cause a lot of AV pros went to some kind of technical school to then become an integrator, but I'm not an integrator, I'm in media. So my understanding of the AV world is not as application-based as theirs because they would just go in and specify a room and be able to do it. So that's where a lot of their knowledge is coming from, but mine is coming from writing about this technology. So as many as, yeah. So as many different people as from as many different walks of life and understanding of AV that I can get on here to talk to me about this and help me kind of hammer out the ideas that are a little more difficult for me to understand the better. So this was, and all the feedback I've gotten so far has been like from people who have let their CTS kind of go, um, who didn't have as many argues and they're like, Oh, well you're getting yours. And I see that I can just follow the podcast and do it with you at Infocom. So I'm going to do it now. So yeah, I definitely agree. It's kind of like a, we're all in this together kind of thing. And, um, next, I was trying to think of my next question. So just really quick, there are 110 multiple choice questions. It's not free answer, correct? Yes. Great. It's multiple, it's, multiple, it's multiple choice. Great. Love to see that. 10 of these questions are pilot questions. So 10 of these are just them testing out, like, should we include this in the exam or is this not a correct question to include here? That is correct. There are 10 questions in the exam that, are, that were uh, put in there by the psychometricians to use as a gauge to see if this question would be a, a good one to use going forward. And how long do you have to answer all these questions again? Three hours. Three hours. Okay. That's Which like- seems, like a long, seems like a long time. Um, but it, for some people who really want to read and get in depth with the question, it could be a little taxing. Yeah. So the cool thing about the, the application that you take the test on is you have the ability to find questions for you for later. And that's something that I encourage everyone. If you're not a solid test taker, um, take your time. But yeah, well, you know what? Everyone comes from different you know, walks of life, right? Yeah. Uh, being able to understand that and be able to flag questions to go back later. It physically won't, won't let you uh, clear the test until you've answered your flag questions. Also, very important. At the bottom of each question, there is a little box for your feedback. 
So if you've done your studying and you read this question and something about it just does not seem right to you, feel free to leave feedback. They actually read the feedback for those questions and help us build a better test going forward. Got you. So if it's just like the wording is a little bit confusing or something yeah, else where I'm like, you could have, could you have worded this this way instead that they want to hear that? That they want to hear all the feedback they can get, right? Okay. Because back to our previous discussion, you know, we, we, you built this on a snapshot in time, yeah. right? And so if things have changed or something isn't quite the way it should be, you know, if we get enough feedback in that realm, that's a, a solid case to make some modifications in flight versus having to reconvene the entirety of the process to edit the certification, right? So those are valid ways to provide that very valuable feedback. Feedback's a gift, we should all get it. Right. And so say I take the test the first time and don't pass. Um, I know that it's it, there are different versions of the test. So passing isn't a cut and dry number. It depends on what version of the test that you have. Um, but say that I take it the first time and don't pass what are the rules for like how many more times I can retake it within the time frame? Like that was just a little bit confusing to me. I have to defer to Greg for that one because I've always honestly been confused a little bit myself. Yeah. Like I've read it a few times and I like went back and I was like, so wait, I can take it three times within 90 days, but do I have to repay? So yeah, I just wanted don't, to know. Yeah, don't like, have to, and I won't be able to honestly give you much more specific off the top of my head. Um, it's, it is in there. It's in that realm. It gives you um, a couple, three extra tries. I think it's two, if I, if I remember correctly, within a fixed time period, of, you know, I think, as you said, like 90 days, then you have, oh, and you, and you, there is a minimum wait between the tests. I believe that's 30 days. Um and then if you don't, if you're not successful after that first round under that first dime, so to speak, um, then you have to go to another weight. And I think you might even have to reapply. Um, so basically you go back, um, you know, to, our, to a restart, complete restart. Okay. And when it comes to the test, like you said, no two are the same. Uh, they pull the questions from a pool of question bank and construct your test just for you based upon those parameters in said pool. Um, and when you get you know, your feedback from the test, it'll tell you the domain areas that you, you struggled in. And you can use that as your, your blueprint to go back and you know, study again and see where you need to catch up. Got you. But so you're gonna pass the first time, I know you are. I hope so. That's, you know, Gary has put that out into the universe that I'm passing the first time. So. I, heard, I, heard, I heard the podcast. That's why I said it. <laughs> so, I mean, it's out there. If I don't pass the first time, I'm going to be in trouble. Um, so there, there are very strict rules for, you know, in-person testing with Pearson. Like you cannot have anything on your person pretty much except for your ID, correct? Correct. So when you walk up to the, to the facility to, to test in person, um, bring with you a, a government issued ID so they can reference that. Um, and in that same vein, don't take anything else with you. Cell phone, watch, calculator. Um, don't go get a tattoo of the Ohm's law on your inside of your arm. Um, God, that was my idea. Uh, you know, it was mine too, until I realized that, you know, I couldn't take it in the test. I had to cover it up with him. Uh, but yeah, you know, all you need is your ID because when you walk in, they're going to put you down. Uh, they're going to sit you down at your desk. You'll have a writing implement. Traditionally, it's been a marker, like a piece of laminated paper for you to do your maths. And I do highly recommend when you first get in there to do your brain up of the application or the uh, equations that you've memorized up until that point. So you can get that knocked out. But uh, again, as one thing Greg mentioned previously, more importantly, do some research as to what uh, Pearson views COVID precautions are as well, because they will allow obviously those things that will keep you safe during the test. Right. Mass, so on and so forth. So uh, get as comfortable as you can be as well. Again, it's going to be three hours. Um, you know, this is going to sound dumb, wear comfy clothes, because any little thing that distracts you during the test, like something not fitting right, something that's itchy, those kind of things, it's going to throw you off and throw off your pace. And um, yeah, I mean, it really is. It's a, it's a very much a, a very regimented process to get in the door. And show up, you know, quote unquote early. 
you know, make yeah. sure you're there and plenty of time beforehand. So you don't have that last minute stress, um, of getting in at your start time. I feel that. So in terms of test taking strategy, so you recommend I get in there as soon as it starts, get my laminated sheet of paper, write down all the formulas that I can remember. Um, so do you recommend going through the test, just kind of like marking the ones that I know, answering those and flagging the ones that I think are going to take me a little bit longer and saving those for the end? Or what do you recommend? So it really depends on what kind of a test taker you are. Everyone's a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, when I took the test, I took the, the test less than 45 minutes because I, well, I speed read and I can take a test pretty fast. Um, okay. But having said that, what you just described is a fantastic test taking strategy for someone who really wants to uh, build your confidence up when it comes to the start of the test, but also to get you thinking about the questions that are kind of floating off in the background. Right, because your brain, being the most amazing difference engine on the face of the earth, once you read something and you're still trying to chew on it, it'll stick in the back of your head, even though you're reading something else. Yeah. But as you go through the test, you mm -hmm. may find something that sparks that little nugget of inspiration. You're like, oh, wait a second, and you can scroll back up and address that one that you flagged. There are a lot of different little ways you can massage that three hours, um, but being aware of time is very important. If you if you scroll through it and out of the, the quite all the questions you answer three that you know for sure and the rest of them are flagged, you know, you may want to pick the pace up a little bit. Yeah. But that, that is a fantastic strategy to get you those quick wins to build the confidence up to go back and really go through and nail the questions. Right. Okay. So in terms of like studying. So there have been like no one, there's no cut and dry answer for like, how do you study for this? So my plan of attack so far has been to slowly move through the book, which is what I'm doing. I'm in chapter two. Y'all are pretty much talking to me about chapter two right now. Um, you know, have people on to that I can ask my questions to about each chapter but also Avixa has so many resources that it's like a little bit overwhelming. Um, so what do you recommend for someone like me who is like, I log into my Avixa dashboard, I'm looking around, I'm a little bit scared. Like, what do you mm. recommend that, uh, how I move through this? Like, do you recommend that I look at the study guide and wait until I come to a chapter that I'm like, oh God, what did I just read? And then go and find the Avixa resources for that chapter or go to one of the general study sessions or what do you recommend? So I would say from, from personal experience, I did what you did. I started by reading the study guide and finding those chapters that uh, crossed my eyes, so to speak, because I was like, I have no clue what you're talking about in this chapter. Uh, and then I found people who helped me answer those questions. It's a fantastic way for you to, again, keep moving forward in, in your understanding path and understanding how things fit together without getting stuck and mired because it, it can be very frustrating. I mean, yeah. if you're reading something and it's clearly across as Greek, um, you're, you're not going to be really in, intrigued or involved to keep going sometimes, right? Now, some people are the exact opposite. They read that chapter, it becomes hard. And, you know, they turn the hat backwards and it's like, I got this. And they just keep hammering at it until they knock it out. Yeah. Um, it really is important, though, to understand kind of what, what kind of learning you are in that environment and how you digest that elephant, you know, one piece at a time. So yeah. stopping and finding help for chapters is fantastic. Uh, going through and digging through a mix of resources at that point in time is, is also fantastic. Chuck Espinosa has made so many videos that reference uh, directly component parts yeah. of what you're going to learn in CTS. And he spells it out for you in very, very, very plain English, which is something that I've always appreciated in those areas. Uh, another thing, another option that is available to everyone when it comes to that is at the show and also online. I, I don't know how many online offerings they're going to have next year. If you really want that final nail in the head reinforcement and it's something you can afford both financially and for the time, is the CTS prep course. Uh, it's three days, but it is an in-depth soup to nuts brain dump into that realm. But you also, again, get access to the, the learning professionals that are going to help you answer those questions. Yeah. So that's that you pay for that separately, correct? Yes, you do. Okay. Yes. And it's available as an online course right now, I'm assuming? 
they did some online courses this past year, given the awesomeness that was the Rona Tide. Um, I'm not, uh, I assume they're still revamping those options for 2021. Yeah. Uh, that would be something to look yeah. for, that would be something to look forward to from Avixa's for kind of announcements of how they're going to address digital learning, but I'm pretty certain we wouldn't be surprised if that is a, an online offering in the future. Yeah. Gotcha. None scheduled right now though, that I know of. Um, kind of going back, I just wanted to follow up because I think, I mean, it was excellent the way Jason, you know, was talking about the approach on on the knowledge gain, right? We're going through the study guide. I would myself fall into that other category where it's similar to the test taking, right? I would tend to be the kind um, that I like to go and kind of actually speed read through the entire book first, right? So I would tend to be the kind that I don't want to go fully linear chapter by chapter by chapter. And, and for a whole lot of reasons, appreciate that's what you're doing for this wonderful um, thing you're doing um, for your peers as well. Um, but the idea of getting through, in the case of the study guide, the entire book as quick as possible, and then making literal notes as it go along as those areas that I know, hey, this is really revealing more um, vividly for me as an individual that I know I'm going to really want to do a deeper dive on. But the other thing inevitably happens, at least with myself, is some of the issues that on chapter three may have been an issue for me might resolve within chapter five because it is after all EV, right? It's, mm -hmm. it, it is a, although it's a linear, we have to ultimately do that, right? In a book, it's a linear thing. AV is, as we all know, is not linear, right? It's, there are a number of interactions and you literally may find a piece of content and a subsequent chapter is like, oh, okay. I got it. That's resolved that. So to me anyways, then and we lost Greg, but I wanted to, I would say like my last question would be if you just had any like one or a couple golden pieces of advice for me to take as I move through this. If you could tell me like one or two things that you say are the most important. All right. Well, th the first thing I would say is don't give up because I don't care how long you've been in this industry. I I've been doing this for 24 years now. I started out as a gear relocation engineer, which is a funny way of saying a roadie. Um, no technical training prior to where I am at this point. There were times where I became supremely frustrated in this whole process, trying to understand, you know, the, the data in front of me. Um, I, I knew what I, I knew what was going on. I had a basic understanding. But there were times where I was supremely frustrated in my studying process, and I just had to close the book and walk away for a little bit and let the brain reset and come back to it because I knew in my heart of hearts that what I was reading did not make any sense because I've done it this way for a thousand years and, you know, trying to do it this way doesn't, sometimes you have to take your brain out, put it aside and just understand the material you're trying to digest. Now it's not teaching the test. That's understanding that's written a certain way for a reason. So don't give up. The frustration is going to set in. Just understand that it's all a part of studying when it comes to anything new or magical and we're going to uh, hand that in and move on. Yeah. My second thing I would say is don't stop. So as I mentioned previously, if you're getting serious about the alphabet soup after your name, CTS is a great place to start. Yeah. But don't stop there. You know, there's a CTSD, there's a CTSI, there are a number of, there's a multitude of programs that Avixa offers, that our partners offer, that people offer to help you really dig into this industry and really build your personal brand around what you want to be when you grow up, right? I haven't decided that yet. I'm just kind of all over the place and it works for me. That's, yes. it, it drives my family crazy, but it works for me. <laughs> um, exactly. But I would say, don't, please don't stop. Don't ever stop. Don't ever reach a point where you think, you know, I've reached the apex of my learning environment and here we are be a lifelong learner in this and take this as the first step, that jumping off point into the multitude of arenas you can use to really further your AV knowledge. Awesome. Well, that, that was great advice. That was 
probably the best piece of advice I've received so far. So I really appreciate it, Justin. I'm excited to be able to show you that I passed at Infocom. I'm hoping to see you there. I, um, you let me let me know when you're taking the test. Okay. I will hang around outside until you pass. Okay. And then we will, we will walk down to the certification table together so we can do our celebration properly. Okay. Sounds good. And Gary has said that we're throwing a stepception after I pass. So I hope to see you there. Um, but it was really nice meeting you. Thank you so much for joining me today. This was great, Stephanie. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye. Bye. One hour later. Um, so I think what we were talking about, uh, Justin was in, you were talking about the, you know, the, um, the methodology overall methodology of learning mode, right. And, and understandably somewhat sequential linear. Um, and then just, you know, kind of counterpoint, I know, and, and, and the way I like to approach it and would say some, some folks might want to look at it that way is, is, you know, take a look at the study guide and, and actually do that first pass on a fairly rapid pace. Um, it's funny. It just occurred to me. This, this is my philosophy of the show floor, right? So for yeah. Infocom, right. Is I go through as quick as I can initially. Um, and same thing in this case. So the book, I go through it chapter by chapter. Um, and you know, it's not about speed reading, but it is about just kind of like, okay, yeah, pretty much good with that. Good with that. Oh, wait a minute. Here's something here. Right. And you're kind of making that mental note. Um, that in particular, I think can be helpful on one of the items, which is now when you're going in linear mode, which you do, right, more the deeper dive, you're going in linear mode, you can encounter some things inevitably, you're going to say, wait a minute, this is kind of a sticking point. But the first kind of self help thing is because AV in itself is not linear. And that's just the nature of the beast that you might be like, oh, wait a minute, I think I remember something else about this topic further into the study guide. And then you could kind of go there, self-help. Yeah. Oh yeah, I got it. Or not, you know, hey, this is still a gap area. I'm going to write that down and I really want to get some extra help on this. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And that just kind of goes along with everything that Avixa says that there's there's no right way to do this. Um, everyone kind of has their own methodologies and their own ways that their brain works and retain information. So yeah, like you, like you said, you can go linearly, but AV isn't linear, so it doesn't totally make sense. So I definitely agree. Um, and you did want to reiterate one point about on like what's going on with testing during COVID, like if online is yeah. an option. So, so yeah, just wanted to uh, I double check on that after I dropped off earlier, and mm -hmm. um, it was kind of my gut. I didn't speak up initially because I wasn't positive that there was something late breaking. It is not currently an option. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, online is not an option, so it will be working, you know, again, going to the website, probably regularly, um, seeing those COVID updates. I did just take a look at myself. The URL that you guys talked about earlier is correct, right? You just slash CTS, go there, and you'll see at the top that will be the COVID notice. Um, and that's in particular if you're going to be around your regional testing center, um, and then, yeah, they, they are working hard on that. It's just, it's like a number of things. It's, it's more complex um, and it's, it's the actually doing it remote as most of us know, that's really not the issue. It's making sure, I, as I understand it, it's making sure that the process is fully valid, right? Including the accreditations behind the, you know, the CTS and the ANSI part. So right. anyway, that's work, working its way through but it is not in the near term an yeah. option. But people are still getting their CTS during COVID. I just saw a blog on the Avixa site that someone had taken the test during COVID. So it sure. is still happening. So I oh, want to make sure that people know that it's the, like testing isn't frozen just because COVID's happening. Like you can't still get your CTS. There's still options. Right. And, and um, you know, I think it's to my knowledge, having not tried to seek it out myself, but as I've seen other people talking about, it makes sense, right? It's a profile of of the rest of the COVID impact, right? Some regionally, right? So regionally could find a, a test center is, is all, the, all of a sudden not available. Um, yeah. But otherwise, yes, they have been. Um, there was a time initially um, when all this first, you know, hit last spring when they all, I think pretty much like dominoes, like a lot of stuff just literally got shut down and then they started coming back up regionally. Yeah. And Justin and I talked about how, you know, even during COVID that like, you're not allowed to bring very much in the testing center. 
um, but they will let you take the things that you need to be safe. So you can obviously wear a mask when you're encouraged to do that. And, you know, the things right. that you need to keep yourself safe and everything right now. So hopefully by the time I take it, this will all be over, like <laughs> fingers crossed. Right. Uh, so hopefully by the time I take it at Infocom, it'll just be regular schmegular again. But um, just for everyone who is going to take their test a little earlier, just so they know that there are safe options for them to go ahead and take their test. Um, so the, I think I asked you all of the questions that I pretty much wanted to ask you, but my last thing I wanted um, to leave with was if you could give me like one piece of advice or a couple pieces of advice that you really think I should take away while I'm moving through this process, um, what would those be? Um, I think the first, well, first of all, I want to say, uh, to, you know, kudos to you and then for everyone that's you know your peers again right the folks that are um are benefiting by your willingness to kind of be out there and and be a champion with them but just kudos seriously for for you and and everybody for um taking that step right to 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 to, to do this the cts certification um it it will Absolutely, I have full confidence be something that you'll achieve and then also, you know, benefit further down the road. Um, I just broadly, you know, everybody I think that I've certainly been exposed to that has done it um, is no remorse, right? Oh, wow, that I, you know, did that. I think the other side of it is for me, the, you know, and full disclosure coming from the learning side of things, you know, passionate about um, that. Keep in mind as you go through the study guide. Um, and, and it's literally the intent as I'm learning, working in an active role on the CTSI uh, that we're working on now on that study guide, updating that one. It is first and foremost, as it's built, it is a study guide for that certification, but it's also you know, definitely intended to be a desk reference, right? So for the practitioners, you know, so it's every day, right? And myself included, right? Even though, okay, I, I know this stuff. Well, no, I don't know all of that don't try to commit it all to memory and so that is the spirit of it too is that you're going through this and so um to some degree understandably it, it, there's a point of okay i'm doing this to cram for a test um but also it's that knowledge that you're gaining and you're having that that desk reference that you can go back to um that is again the spirit at the end of the day of the certification, right? Because once you have your CTS, someone else is going to kind of look at you differently, right? They're going to, because especially if they have a CTS, right? You kind of like, hey, we get it. We know our conversation now starts at a CTS level, right? Yeah. We, we have that common um, knowledge base. So again, For kudos, sure. Steph. Um, I appreciate it. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be fun to uh, keep pace as you're going through. Yeah, for the sure. This spring. Yes. And I hope to see you at Infocom and to give you a high five once I pass it. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much, Greg. Sure thing. Study with Steph.